Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. I'm Pastor Harold Noyce, pastor of the Community Christian Church in Athens, Vermont. And also I have my co-host with me, Tim Golden. He's pastor of Life on Main in Charlestown, New Hampshire. And it's a delight to be able to bring to you uh, Hotline Ministry. It's a ministry where we take the Word of God and we try to apply it to our hearts. We, we look at what God has said so that our hearts will be touched by him and by his word. We have been studying on the 31 reasons why Jesus has come to earth. And we found that the very first reason that Jesus came was to do the will of the Father. And each time, now this is like the 15th segment, each time we've done it, it always has to go right back to Jesus doing the will of the Father. He came last week, for example, to pay our ransom. The week before that, he came to fulfill the law and the prophets and so forth. And today we're going to look at it and see that Jesus came to reveal God's love for you and me as sinners. He came to reveal God's love for us as sinners. I'm going to ask Pastor Tim if he would open in prayer, and then we will read our scripture. It's John 3, 14 through 21, and we have some other scriptures besides, but we'll start with the John 3 scripture. So Tim, would you open? Ask the Lord to bless our time, please. Sure. Lord God, we thank you so much for the ability to gather together, even if it be across long distances. And we ask that you would be in our time together, that you would speak to our hearts, that, Lord, if there's anything that Harold and I are sharing that's just of us, that it wouldn't, that it would all just fall by the wayside. Uh, but anything of you would take root in our hearts. It would do something that would be lasting and ever-changing within us. And, and uh, we ask for you to have your perfect way in our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So remember now that, that the title of this program and the theme of this program is Jesus Came to Reveal God's Love. We're going to look at the probably the most typical portion of Scripture that most everybody knows, at least they've heard it in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. But I'm going to start with verse 14 and go down through verse 21 because there's a lot in there that we need to see concerning God's love for us. So starting in verse 14 of John chapter 3, it says this, and Tim's going to put it on the screen, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth good cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought or worked in God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. 
as we now discuss this portion of scripture as well as others to show how Jesus came to reveal God's love for us. Tim, there's a, there's a word that in this chapter, like for example, in verse, verse seven, it says, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. So you got the word must in verse seven, and then in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. To me, that's pretty emphatic. To me, that's pretty, you know, right there, you know, hitting everything in a nutshell. This has to happen. Mm -hmm. And if this does not happen, then nothing's going to happen, right? That That's correct. Um, it's And I like the fact that he started it with marvel not. In other words, don't be surprised at what I'm saying here. Because it, it really shouldn't come as any surprise to you. But this is something that has got to happen. It's not open for discussion. It's not open for debate. You can deny it all you want. You can pretend there's some other way. But this is the reality. And there's no way to avoid it. So, you know, maybe someone who would be watching might even ask this question to us, Tim. And it says, well, what right does God have to determine how it is that I get to have eternal life. I mean, what right does he have to say unto me, you must be born again, or Jesus must be lifted up? I mean, what right does God have to do that for us? What right does he have not to tell us that? <laughs> you know, I mean, everything that is only exists because he made it. So he has every right on that grounds and that grounds alone. I mean, we would not exist apart from him. You know, the mere fact that our cells even stay together the way that they do and don't go floating off into oblivion is all nothing short of his miraculous um, design uh, for each and every one of us. So the fact that he created us makes him the maker, makes him the master. And the real question should be, what right do we have to tell him he doesn't have a right? Mm -hmm. Because... Yeah. He's the one that ultimately can say, hey, you know, fine, you want to act that way. This is the way it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it goes right back to last week's program, Tim, where we talked about Jesus being the ransom for us because we found the scripture that says, well, you and I were bought with a price. So we are not our own. We are owned now by God. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he bought and paid for us, right? I mean, so God, God owns us. Therefore, he has the ability, he has the right, he has the power to say, this is the way the plan of salvation works. Mm -hmm. You must be born again. Yeah, and right? the thing is, is that originally, this didn't have to happen. Originally, there was no need to have to be born again, had we not messed things up in the garden to begin with. So the mere fact that there has to, that he even provides another opportunity to be born again, it's not a, we shouldn't look at it as an aspect that what right does he have? Like he's requiring me to do something I shouldn't do. We should be thankful that we even have that opportunity to be born again because he, by all rights, we should be doomed to our sin and the death that is a result of that. But because of his grace and his grace alone through Jesus Christ, do we have the ability to experience this miraculous ability to be born again and to get restored back into a relationship that we were meant to have way back in Genesis? Now, maybe what we, we might need to do, Tim, before we get into the remaining scriptures is to spend just a moment and, you know, ask maybe the same question that, for example, Nicodemus asked, um, how can I be born again? What does that mean to be born again? How, how does that work? I mean, how, what takes place? You know, how, how does that happen anyway? Well, it's first realizing Nicodemus's question. How do you enter again into the mother's womb? First of yeah. all, who would want to? Yuck. Yeah. You know? but, um, but the thing is, is, as Jesus said in response to Nicodemus's question, he's like, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Back in Genesis, when we chose to sin, when mankind chose to partake of that fruit that Jesus said, or that God said, don't do this, but we acted in disobedience and we did that, sin entered into us. 
at that very moment, we, we experienced a spiritual death. Adam experienced a spiritual death. Eve experienced that death immediately. Even though physically they would die later, they spiritually at that point were dead. And so that means separation from God. Exactly. In their and relationship. So that spirit man, if you will, is what has to be born. Uh, because we are born, it says, into sin. So we are actually born in a, as paradoxical as it might sound, we are actually born into a state of death um, from the minute that we leave the mother's womb. And that even though we are breathing air, there is the spirit man that still has got to experience a birth. And that comes only through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we receive Jesus into our hearts, he then, through the Holy Spirit, breathes life into our spirit, much like God breathed life into the nostril of man in Genesis. And we then at that point can begin to experience life. And again, just like the, spirit, the death that they had was instantaneous, when you accept Christ, the life you have happens then not after you die it happens when you receive him at that moment you are born again and begin to walk in this new eternal life so our salvation comes the moment we trust jesus christ as our personal savior the moment for example in verse 15 of this portion of scripture we're looking at whosoever believeth in him should not perish so being born again I must believe who Jesus Christ is. Not that he's just a man. Not that, that he was just some carpenter or some poor, you know, individual, you know, because he didn't have a lot of wealth. He didn't have a pillow even to lay his head. I mean, not, you know, but to believe who he is. He is the son of God. And he did exactly what he said that he would do. When he died upon the cross at Calvary, he died to buy us back, mm -hmm. to pay the penalty for our sin, right? Right. I mean, he, that's what he did. So, so that's what you have to believe, though, isn't it? It does. And we need to re realize, too, that this belief is more than just what we think of as belief. You know, uh, as a child, you no know, kids believe in Santa Claus, right? It's, it's a matter of I, th th this is what I, I, intellectually understand to be a reality. Uh, but when it talks about believing on Jesus Christ, it, that encompasses, first of all, believing that he is actually God. It's believing intellectually, all that stuff. But it's deeper than that. It's deeper than a belief system. It, it's got to go into the fabric of who we are. And it carries with it that not only do I believe in your literal existence, it's that I trust in who you are. I trust that you are God. And I am willing to back that belief system up with my life and with the way that I choose to live my life. And so that is what the word believe really means. It tells us um, elsewhere, and I forget the exact scripture reference right now, but it actually breaks it down saying that the person that will be saved is he who confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead. You know, so you've got the Savior and Lord concept. You know, it's not just accepting the price for sin, accepting the fire insurance, if you will. It's also understanding he is Lord. He has a right to govern my life, and I'm willing to let him do that. So it's more than just a head knowledge. It's more than just believing as to what the historians have said he is. But it is believing also in our heart. I I. I look at the picture as this. For example, I believe that Patty is my wife. However, it goes a lot deeper than that in my love relationship with my wife. Not just simply say, well, I have on a piece of paper that we're married and that's it. No, there's a whole lot more. There's a relationship. There's an intimacy. There's a closeness, you know, that now determines, you know, my life. And it's the very same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if I just want to intellectually say to Patty, you're my wife, or do I want to show her? Do I want to reveal to her who she is and who I am to her? That is, that is, in my view at least, what it means to be born again. 
when when we take God revealing his love to us and us now taking that love and revealing it back to him in our love relationship with him. To me, that's what born again is. It's a heart experience, the heart relationship where he's now my all in all. You know, you take whether it be in the Old Testament, it says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. You know, that kind of determines everything. That's who he is. Mm-hmm. So belief is more than just a head knowledge. It means I know now what it is to have a relationship with a living God. And that relationship becomes very, um, oh, what's the word I want? It's very um, obvious to everybody that's around you. Yeah, I, I think back to, you know, especially days that, you know, we're dating or when anybody's dating, right? Um, you seldom have to go up to somebody and say, oh, by the way, guess what? I'm dating so-and-so. They're like, yeah, I can tell. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I just look at the way that you look at them and I can tell that you've, you know, you've, you've got that going on. So um, it's when you've got that kind of a relationship, you don't even have to go around proclaiming it. Not that we shouldn't. Okay, I and mean, we do have an obligation and responsibility to share our faith with people, but it should be so evident within us that when we do say it, people are like, "Oh yeah, I could see it. It was written all over you," you know. And so that is where the belief system comes in. It has no choice but to actually reflect in everything that we do. Now, also, Tim, in that belief system, in, in believing who Jesus Christ is, not just believing in him, but believing him. And that's that, that's one of the differences that I find in the scripture is that, you know, it's one thing to believe in him. The other thing is simply to believe him. Mm. Yeah. Believe what he says. Yeah. He has spoken. That is it. And and then we look in verse 15, for example, where he goes and he says the whosoever. And I love that because who does eternal life or who does this being born again? Who does it include? Anybody that's willing to grab hold and, um, and run with it. Yeah. So it's, for, it's open to everybody. Nobody is excluded. No, no um, ethnic group. No, um, whether you're handsome or ugly or whether, whatever it is, you know, short, black, whatever, whatever. Okay. It doesn't make any difference. God, God is not a, you know, he's not a respectable person, so therefore he doesn't look at somebody and say, no, you're from the wrong group, or you're from the wrong color, you're from the, you know. No, he doesn't do that at all. God just says, look, I'm opening this up for the whole world, everybody in the world, to believe in me. Mm-hmm. And, and believe what really, I did. And what's really cool with that, too, is it's not even limited by our ages. No. You know, it's amazing to me that something as profound as the scriptures are, that God has made it so that even a child can understand it. And not that this is either here nor there. It's not. And it's not to be sound boastful. But I, mean, I accepted the Lord when I was five years old. Right. Started my now, way, and, by the way. Now, granted, I didn't have the level of understanding that I have today. But it was simple enough that even at the age of five, I could make that decision. My son was three when he made that decision to follow Christ. And he's walking with him today, even in his 20s, you know? Yep. and. Um, so that is, it, it's just so incredible that it's not only bridges all the socioeconomic barriers, it even bridges all the age barriers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was 19 when I came to know Christ as my savior. And, and, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's something I, my dad, my, when he got saved, he was in his, I think he was 50 something when he trusted Christ as savior. So I, I like that, that, you know, God, you know, doesn't look at this and say, oh, well, You've lived your life too long. Sorry. You know, the expiration date has happened, right? No, God is not that way. Now, one of the things, Tim, that I find very interesting in verse 15 also is that the purpose of trusting Christ the Savior and knowing what it is to be born again or knowing what it is to believe in him is because in verse 15, he indicates to us that when we do die, that there's one of two places we can go. Because we find here, it says, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
So that gives you that there's, you know, that there were two options. You can either go to hell and perish. Now, perish does not mean to be annihilated, by the way, does it? Perish just simply means that you you no longer have the opportunity to have a, a relationship with God. That is going to be exempt from forever and ever, as opposed to have eternal life means to be able to live with God forever. So, so that is the decision in which we as human beings have to make. Where do I want to spend eternity? When a person dies, they do not just, just you know, as we go and review, for example, the body of a loved one or whatever, and there's nothing there. But that isn't what happens to, to us, as, you know, in our soul and our spirit. When we, though we may be dead on earth, we're going to be very much alive for eternity in one of two places, right? I mean, it's, that's, that's really what he's talking about. So we need to make the decision here and not wait, you know, I've had a lot of people say to me, well, I'm going to wait until I die. And then if I go to hell, I'm going to see if I like that. Or if I go to heaven, no, you're not going to have another chance after you take your last breath. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got to make the decision now, right? I mean, we. Well, that's it. It's, it's, and that's why he said you must be born again if you want to have any chance at, you know, uh, I shouldn't even say it have any chance because it's not left up to chance at that point. It's a guarantee, yeah. uh, you know, once you, you know, accepted Christ that you will be with him for eternity. But um, but he's making it very clear. You, This is the way it's got to happen. You know, don't you can't make up the rules. You, you can't, uh, you know, put addendums to this thing. These are the requirements. This is how it takes place. But the choice is yours. You know, either you can accept it or not. And uh, I remember I preached a sermon back probably about five, six months ago now um, talking about hell. And we were just examining this whole aspect of, you know, destinations and that, you know, we all we all have a ticket somewhere. You know, every, every person that's on the face of the planet has a ticket. The thing is, is when you're born that we are all given the same ticket and that ticket goes straight to hell, you know, point blank. Yep. And every one of us, that's our ultimate destination. Unless we choose to take that ticket and trade it in for a different ticket and that ticket goes straight to heaven. And Jesus is the only one that can make that exchange of the tickets. But if we don't accept him, we're left holding the original ticket that we were dealt or that we were given. So, you know, that's why I say, you know, you want a different way. You want to be able to experience life everlasting. You got to be born again. You got to exchange your ticket in for this better ticket that I am more than willing to give to you, no, you know, without any additional cost necessary. So, as we look at this, this so important portion of scripture you know where, where god goes and gives us this picture look this is what you must do you know it's not it's just not a, it's not a an option you have to do this then he goes and he gives us what god says that he did for us he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever is that word again it's for anybody Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you have it in verse 5, that you should not perish and have everlasting life. You have it in verse uh, 15, excuse me. And then you also have it in verse 16. You should not perish and have everlasting life. So God says, look, just in case you didn't catch it in verse 15, I'm going to give it again to you in verse 16. So how, how important is it to God? that we understand, hey, there are two options that I'm laying on the table. One option is death, one option is life. You choose the one you want, yeah. you know? And so many people would, you know, have said to me over the years in my past trip, and probably to you, to you too, Tim, why did God send so-and-so to hell? You know, uh, wait a minute, is he the one who sent them? No. Not according to this portion of scripture. Because we see in this portion of scripture where he goes in verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
So what he's saying to us is this, look, you've condemned yourself because God has given us the map, the roadmap, the instructions of what needs to be done for us to have eternal life. And if we do not take God's instruction and follow God's instruction, then we have condemned ourselves. Isn't that what he's saying to us? Exactly. Exactly. And and we don't, I mean, even, even apart from that, I mean, he's just confirming what we already know from the Old Testament, right? All the way back in Genesis. I mean, he meant for us to live forever. He meant for us to be able to be in communion with him all the time. And we see very clearly that during the cool of the day, scripture tells us he would come and he would walk with Adam, you know, side by side. And there's just this incredible um, camaraderie, this, this great relationship that was taking place until we made the decision to eat that fruit, you know, until we made the decision to disobey. And then that forced the consequences that ended up having to come down the pike because God is a righteous God. God is a holy God. He cannot have communion with sin, you know? And so, but yet he didn't leave us in that. He then, as we said, made the way and, and did everything that he could possibly do except force us to accept him. And he can't force us to accept him because that would go against his very character. And we wouldn't have a love relationship if he forced us to. And so for people to even want to say that, look, God wouldn't send somebody to hell. And so therefore, we should all just be able to go to heaven. Well, first of all, he can't have that fellowship with sin. And for him to make you go to heaven would be for him to renege on a promise of free will that he gave each and every one of us. And he gave us that free will out of love because he didn't want to demand or dictate our affections. In fact, you cannot have love apart from a choice, which is why the tree was put in the middle of that garden to begin with. It wasn't to tempt man. It was to give him the ability to make a choice to love and obey the Father. And so his, salvation. Which was salvation, right. And, and he's, the call is still the same today. You know, look, we have a choice we need to make of our free will. But here's the gift. It's right here, right before you. I want you to have it. I'm waving it in front of your nose, in front of your face, but I cannot force you to take it. You've got to reach out, grab hold of it, and receive it for yourself. Once you do, I'll guarantee all the blessings that I already promised you in Scripture. So what God is saying to us then is because, all right, Someone, someone may say to us, well, yeah, but I didn't eat of the fruit. That happened back in the garden with Adam and Eve. So why do I have to pay the penalty for what Adam and Eve did some 8,000 years ago? Okay, well, let's just go back to the Ten Commandments. Who's lied? You know, or told a little fib, because a fib is a lie, yeah. <laughs> right? It's false witness. How many of us have lusted after somebody that we weren't married to? How many of us have stolen something? And th that may have not necessarily gone out, meant going out to a store and robbing the place, but how many of us have stolen from our employers as far as time that they, are, that they deserve and things of that nature? See, and breaking any one of those scriptures says you break one, you've broken them all. So anything that we have done that has been contrary to Christ, that is contrary to his holiness, distances us and, and subjects us to the same penalty as Adam and Eve received for eating that fruit, because it is all disobedience to God. And so maybe you weren't Adam and Eve. Maybe you didn't do the initial one, but you know what? We've all done it since. And But even apart from doing it, even if you didn't, which, by the way, is totally impossible because Scripture says even our best righteousness is filthy as rags. But even if we didn't do any of that, the mere fact that the first man and woman sinned, Scripture says we are all born into it. It is a condition that infects every single person from this point on. The only remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's no different, for example, than you and I being born into our families. I mean, I'm a noise. Um, I have the traits of the noise, you know. Um, and, and people can look at me and they can say, I know, you know, if I go back to my hometown, for example, 
they would be able to look at me and say, I know who your father was. I mean, just look at you. You look a lot like your dad. You, you, you have mannerisms like your dad. My wife upstairs, when we, you know, when we, we play cribbage. And every once in a while, she'll look at me and she'll say, I just saw you, your father in you. Whether it be the way you held your head and the way you did this, the way you said this, you know, I just saw threat, you know. And, and that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. So God goes and he, he gives us the problem. But he also gives us the remedy to the problem. And that's one of the reasons that one of my favorite words in the scripture, in all of scripture, one of my favorite words is, but. Because God gives you the problem, then he uses the word but, and he says, here's the remedy. You know, or he may give you the remedy and say, but here's, here's the reason for the remedy. Here's the problem. So now we have that in verse 16 and 17, because even though he says, look, if you don't believe in him, you're condemned already because you have made that choice. Pastor Tim has already explained that to us, that it has to do with a choice. I mean, today in our world, in our society, there's a big thing about making choices, isn't there? Mm. You know, I mean, you take the abortion situation, you know, they're, they're screaming, well, it's a woman's choice. A woman has to be, make the choice and all of this. So whatever it is in which we do, it's a choice, you know, and well, salvation is a choice. Either you can choose to believe Jesus Christ for who he is and what Jesus Christ did, or you can choose not to. But here is the problem. If you choose not to, you're going to perish and go to hell. If you choose to, then you're going to be able to have eternal life with him. You're going to be able to live with him in heaven for all eternity. Now, to me, it doesn't, yeah, to me, it's not a hard choice, but maybe the only reason I've seen that is because now, because I have, then I now see the difference. But if someone told me, and I was told back when I was 18 years old, I didn't see the need to make the choice. But then when I was 19, and I went to a service, and I heard a message, and God spoke to my heart, and it's almost like he, he said to me, Harold, Tonight's the night you've got to make the choice. I'm laying it flat out for you. You know, you can either have this or you can have this, but this is your choice. And that was the night that I chose to trust Jesus Christ in my personal Savior. And he's doing the very same thing in this John chapter 3, mm -hmm. where he goes and says, look, here's the problem. Verse 16 and 17, here's the remedy. And then verses 18 to 21, look, God is saying to us, I'm not the one condemning you. Mm -hmm. You're condemning yourself if you choose not to believe what my son, this is God speaking, believe what my son did for you upon Calvary. Yeah. And that's the choice, right? It is. I mean, the worst thing we can do is make a choice one way or the other and then blame God for the choice that we made. Yeah. You know, it, it just, it's not rational. It, you know, it's totally illogical to do that. And so we need to, you know, it, you know, and we're not saying we're not we're not forcing anybody. And so you don't like what we say. You can always turn off the station. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or go to a different website, whichever way you're watching. But um, but we're just laying it out there. We're just letting you guys know what it is that the Lord has, has made very, very clear. And what he's ultimately saying is, look, everything has been provided for you. If you just reach out and grab it. And but, you know, the choice I ultimately leave in your hands because I love you that much to let you make your own decision here. And but be aware that my heart is that you choose life, right? Yeah. That was, that's verse 17. Yeah. He did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His desire is that we choose wisely. But if we choose not to, we need to at least man up enough to be able to say, I made that choice, not God. Because when we get to heaven, there's going to be no excuses. You're not going to be able to stand before God and say, but God, you said you love me. And it's like, and he'll look at you and say, you know what? I do love you. But the problem is you chose not to love back. And so I never knew you. Yep. Yep. And, you so, know, you, and so you've made your bed, you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, one of the things that scares me, Tim, and, and I, I say it this way, is, you know, when, when we, 
go through the ultimate judgment. You know, and, and now I don't know where you stand on this, but my personal belief is not only will I be at the judgment seat of Christ, which will be the throne of awards, but I also think that I will be present, though I will not be judged at the Great White Throne judgment. And I don't want anyone to be able to come back to me at the Great White Throne judgment and look at me in the face and say, Harold, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Mm -hmm. You know, because I want everybody to know, look, today, if you're watching this program, you have to make the choice. You will not be able to stand before God and say, oh, I used to watch Hotline Ministry and they never told me how to get saved. They never told me how to be born again. They never told me what I must do. Well, certainly today we're telling you, look, you must be born again. And this is how you to be born again is by trusting and believing in Jesus Christ that he died upon the cross at Calvary, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day. And one day he's going to come back and take us to be with himself. That is the gospel. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Yeah. So and the great thing is, is that the salvation that we receive, because I, I know there's probably some that, you know, or again, you know, because the, the enemy throws all kinds of mental attacks at us when, when we're given these options. And I know one of them is going to be, there's no way I can live this Christian life thing. And, you know, as somebody who's walked with God now for 49 years and Harold for however many years that's been, <laughs> um, of, yeah. we, we can tell it's you this fun. much. You're right. You can't do it. We can't do it. We are totally inept at being able to live the life fully the way that God wants. And we mess up on a daily basis. There's none of us that's able to get this right. But the thing is, is that the salvation that God gave us then is available to us tomorrow and the next day and the next day he he doesn't make us live these things out he, he doesn't just give us the gift of salvation there now you're on your own he through the holy spirit has promised to help us walk this thing out and so that we can walk tomorrow maybe a little bit more holy than we were today and the next day a little bit more holy than the day before that you know and uh, so don't let whether or not you're able to live it um, become a determining factor because we'll tell you right now you can't do it but through jesus christ he'll help you he's helped us you know what i find so very interesting tim in this portion of scripture god lays out that fact because if we go down for example and look at verse 19 and 20 it says this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and then verse 20 and everyone that does evil hates the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. So, what is the problem? What is the dilemma? We were born in sin. Therefore, we like darkness. What the Spirit of God does, though, is he shares with us these portions of Scripture, for example, these and all the others. But this portion of Scripture and points to us and says, look. You live, you are living in darkness. But I want to show you how to live in light. And that is, first of all, you need to believe upon Jesus Christ. What he did, what he provided, what he secured for you. So that now you're going to start walking in light. Does that mean you never walk in darkness? No. Just as Pastor Tim just said, look, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Paul goes and even states it better, I think, where he says, look, I am the least of the apostles. I am the greatest of sinners. And even the apostle Paul said that. And that was after he trusted Christ as Savior. So, so what we're saying is, look, we're not, we're not saying you do this and all of a sudden you put a, a holier-than-thou shroud on and, and all of a sudden, you know, you never do anything wrong again. That is not true. But all God requires is that you believe upon his son and what his son did for you upon Calvary Street. And, and that, is the, that is the beauty of it, is that God deals with us individually, personally, intimately. Each one of us, you know, I could not say, oh, Tim and I are good friends and, and I can will Tim to have eternal life. No, I can't do that. Tim had to make that choice on his own. Just as I had to make that choice on my own, and you have to make that choice on your own. Nobody else can do it for you. 
Even God can't do it for you. You have to do it. But God is laying out, here's the platform, here's everything I've done. All I, all, all I require of you is believe what I've done for you. Mm-hmm. And what was that? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Mm-hmm. He sent his son from heaven to come to earth to live for 33 years. Then he sent him on the cross. By the way, Jesus often laid down his life. So, you know, he did it willingly. You know, it wasn't the father pulling on Jesus and he was fighting the father. They, no, I don't want to go. No, no, he didn't do that. Jesus Christ laid down his life. Why? Because his father sent him to do a job. And that job was this, is that he paid the penalty for you and for me that we could have eternal life. And to me, Tim, that, that's just, that's the, that's the crutch of the whole thing. Jesus came to do what? He came to reveal God's love for us. Peter said it very well. When Peter, I think it's in Second Peter chapter one, he goes and says, "God desires that none should perish, mm-hmm. but that all should come to repentance." So, what is God's heart? Is God's heart for you who are watching to go to hell? Absolutely not. That is not God's heart. God's heart is for you today to say, "Jesus, I trust you as my Lord and Savior. I know you died for my sins." I know you carried my sins upon the cross. And Lord, I want to thank you for that. I want to praise you for that. And Lord, I trust you for that. I believe you did that for me. And if you said that, and if you realize that today in your own life, then you can just say, Jesus, come into my life, save me, cleanse me, make me the person you want me to be, and then believe that God did it. Is it that simple, Tim? It really is that simple. Uh, and, and that is maybe why so many people have a hard time with it. Because I think in some ways it would be easier for us to swallow if we had to do something more. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, because then we can take some sort of accolades for it, you know, and, and maybe pat ourselves on the back a little bit. But Jesus made it very clear that, look, this is a free gift that's offered to you. And it's done that way for one reason. So nobody can boast. Nobody can say, I was better than this person you know it's the we all come on the same equal ground none of us is worthy all of us have sinned but jesus made the way and jesus paid the price and so we all are left in this place of just being filled with incredible gratitude uh for the father and the ability to be able to love others around us the way that christ loves them and that he loved that he was willing to die for them you know tim another another aspect that i think is really interesting is this is for example with tim and i being pastors and and such you know when we get to heaven and, and we're, we're assured we're going to go to heaven because we have trusted christ as our personal savior we have believed on him and what he did when i get to heaven and i see guys like the billy grants and the george whitfields and the charles spurgeons and you can go through hundreds and thousands of greater men who have done greater things than we have done but you know something when we get to heaven guess what we're all going to be on equal terms Mm -hmm. how did you get here i got here through jesus christ and believing on him as as god had told me to do that's it you know god god isn't saying well harold you know you can have eternal life if you lead 100 million people to christ no i have eternal life by simply trusting Jesus Christ as my personal savior, you know, and trying to be faithful to that which he has called me to do. Yeah, and, and I'm not gonna be in competition with the Billy Grahams and, and all the rest of them when I get to heaven. It just isn't gonna happen. Right, and it's, it's probably why that the one song that is the most popular, not just in churches, but even among non-Christians, is that simple song by Isaac Watts, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the song that everybody can sing because that's where everybody is at, and it all brings the glory back to Jesus. You know, and there's another song too, Tim. Uh, um, Tim and I, I love music, so that another song that just comes to mind, you know, uh, just as I am without one plea. Mm. Yeah. 
and that's exactly how Jesus Christ once wanted me and wants us just as we are. Yeah. Don't try to put on any airs. Don't try to, well, I'll, I'll come to Jesus when I clean up my act. No, he wants you the way you are today. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the scripture is very clear. Today is the day of salvation. Yeah. I don't want you to wait to try to clean up your act. You know what the problem is? You'll never clean up your act. Well, the problem is, is, as I said before, none of us is righteous. The soap that we have is dirty soap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's just going to make us dirtier. The only one that's got the clean soap is Jesus. So yeah. go to him, let him do the work. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, and to me, Tim, that, that seems to be the hardest thing for so many to accept is that Jesus Christ has already done. He's already accomplished it. He's already fulfilled it. Mm -hmm. All we need to do is just believe that he did. Mm -hmm. He did it for me. Yeah. You know, um, it's easy for me to believe he did it for Tim Golden. But would he do it for me? Yes, he did it for me. And he mm -hmm. did it for you. Who's ever watching? He did it for you. I and, had a when, and when did he do it for you? When did he do it for me? Even before it the foundation of the world, by the way. That's right. And, and it wasn't, yeah, so it was before we were even born. But it wasn't after you and I made a decision to follow him. It wasn't after we decided to accept the call into the ministry. He did it all the way back when we were living for ourselves, when, when we were going our way, when we didn't want anything to do with God. That's when he did it for us. Could Not you give us this in Romans 5, 8? Yeah, we can put that right up. Right up. I mean, because this is exactly what Pastor Tim is talking about, uh, Romans 5, 8. Where he goes and says, but, and once again, my favorite word, why? Because here's the problem, now here's the remedy, here's the remedy. But God commanded his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when did he do it? He did it for me while I was yet a sinner lost in my own sin. He did it for you when you were still a sinner lost in your own sin. He said, look, I will take the payment that needs to be done for you, or the penalty that needs to be done for you in payment for your sin. What an amazing God we have. It you is. Know? It is. And, and, and I think the other big thing for us to do, because I think that sometimes, you know, even for us that are, that are believers, um, sometimes it's easy for us to remember that verse, that while I was a sinner back then, mm -hmm. he, he loved me, he forgave me, but we have to remind ourselves every day sometimes about that, especially when we find ourselves in um, situations that we have been struggling with for, for years, probably. Um, you know, even after coming to know the Lord, you know, there's still those sin struggles that we have or those hindrances that we fall into. And we begin, I think, sometimes to fall prey to the enemy's arguments that, well, you know what? You've done this now for the 5,767th time. No way is God going to forgive you now. And it's realizing if he loved us that much then, he loves us the same amount today. And that the grace that was given us then is still available to us today, is still available tomorrow, next month, next year. And so it's learning that we live in this constant state of grace that is available to us uh, every moment of every day. You know, Tim, it's at the end of this chapter, or at least at the end of the section that we read in verse 21, there's a, a tremendous statement here that actually, I'll be honest with you, it's been a while since I had fully read over several times this portion of scripture because it becomes just a part of us. But in verse 21, it goes and says, but he that does food comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And what, and, and, and you know, I almost, I had to do some thinking for a minute. What does he mean, they are wrought in God? And what it means is this, it's all by God's working. It's all God done. He did it all. He paid the price for me. He's the one who, who died on the tree. He's the one who, who left heaven and came down to live as a man and take on the incarnation so that I could have life. So what is my part? What is it I have to do? Just believe it. Because God's already done all the work. 
And that's what he's saying at the end of verse 21. That you may be manifest that they are wrought or work by God. God did it. You know, and, and to me, that, that is such an amazing truth. You know, just like the, the Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that you also had made mention of. You know, by grace you were saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Right. You know, and not that any man should boast, you know. So, you know, when I get to heaven, Billy Graham is going to come up to me, shake my hand and say, yeah, you see all the great works I did, or some of the other great men of God who, who did phenomenal for God. No, guess what? They're all going to say, Harold, guess what? I'm here because of the price that Jesus Christ paid for me. And you're here because of the price that Jesus Christ paid for me. Guess what? We are on equal terms. You did the work God has called you to do. I did the work God has called me to do. But it is all God's doing that did it. Mm -hmm. And we have to believe that. That's what we have to believe. It's all God's doing. You know, to me, that, that is just phenomenal. You know, another portion of scripture, you know, I don't know how much time we have left. We're down to five minutes. Well, down to five minutes. Three or right. four now. <laughs> so just a couple of minutes. But, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're if you interested and you want to go a little further in this discussion, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21 in there, where it talks about, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. God makes us brand new people. Now, making me brand new people does not make me sinless. Making me brand new people does not mean that I'm never going to disappoint God or, or do something bad or anything. No. But I tell you what, he's, he's going to change your attitude. He's going to change who people are going to see you for who you are. And it's, and it's worked in my life. It's worked in Tim's life. And that's exactly what God wants to do with you. He wants to make you a brand new creature in Christ. All right? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Today, you can have that happen to you by simply believing Jesus Christ on what he did at, on Calvary Street for you. I'm Pastor Harold Norris, pastor of the Community Christian Church. And of course, as you know, because of the, the pandemic, we have not been having morning worship services. But you can catch me on Facebook uh, at 8.30 on Sunday morning or anytime during the day to punch in Harold Norris. And you will see that uh, there'll be a little video that I did, a little message that I did on Sunday morning. And I know that Tim uh, does live uh, broadcasts of his morning service at 11 o'clock. So, uh, you know, tune in. Hear the word of God. And then when, when things get back to normal, whatever that's going to be, um, you know, then we'd love to have you come on out to the Community Christian Church in Athens, Vermont. We're on the lower road in Athens, 9.30 morning worship, and we'd love to have you come out and see. Tim? And when we resume, we're uh, on Main Street in Charlestown at the old St. Luke's Episcopal Building, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Uh, we are, as Harold said, also on Facebook. Uh, you can find us at facebook.com slash life on Main. Uh, we air the services uh, there at 11 o'clock. We also have daily videos on various uh Christian topics throughout the week. So feel free to pop in and uh, just take those things in as well. Um, but as Harold says, we do thank you guys for watching. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can connect with Heartline and get the word out about Heartline. Uh, we are, of course, um, here on Fat TV, um, but we're also in Brattleboro, Springfield, uh, as well as up in the Northeast Kingdom uh, on their community stations. You can also find us on the Fact 8. Uh, dot com website as well as on their youtube channel um or just go over to our facebook page at facebook.com slash heartline ministries if you don't have time to watch but you'd like to just listen to these um episodes you can get those on your favorite podcast providers we are on i think the last count has been about 18 you see them all right there uh, our newest editions are itunes and apple podcasts so if you are an apple user uh, you can get them there we are also um, available on the alexa um amazon alexa um devices so um hope to have you guys tune in those ways. So, Pastor Norris for Pastor Tim Golden, thank you so much for watching Heartline Ministry.